The legacy of ACAC was sparked by a promise. If God would step in and be our superintendent, then we, his church, would run his errands. Sometimes those errands are at home, at work, or in our neighborhood. But sometimes they call us to the ends of the earth. In our 130 year history, ACAC has proudly sent 131 men and women to serve as international workers in the missions fields all over the globe. They are shining the light of hope only found in Jesus into the darkest of places. This Missions Month, we challenge you to consider what errands are you called to run in taking his word to the ends of the earth? Amen. Our text for day, today is in the book of Isaiah. If you have your Bible and want to turn with us, Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6. I know many of you use digital means, so by all means, go ahead and turn there. We're going to get to there in just a moment. Uh, what a wonderful weekend last weekend was, celebrating our 130th birthday as a church. Just thank you for, all right, one last time. Happy belated birthday. Um, just thank you for your engagement and all of the weekend's activities. And especially, uh, there literally were hundreds of folks, uh, many of you, who served last weekend. You helped us with setup and cleanup and serving. So I just want to say thank you. It was uh, really a special weekend. I hope that you learned um, and heard some great stories about our church's rich history, and I'm excited to see the new stories that God is going to write in the years to come. One of the stories, as it relates to missions, that we did not share that I learned in the past couple weeks is an absolutely miraculous one, and, um, and I don't say that lightly. In 1833, we kind of talked a lot about the mid to late 1800s last weekend, but in 1833, Jane Holmes was one of Pittsburgh's earliest philanthropists, and she established the Protestant Home for Incurables in her family's converted country home, which today is Lawrenceville. So uh, believe it or not, that used to be country. But uh, she converted this uh, family home that is in Lawrenceville into a... Uh, something called the Protestant Home for Incurables. And years after its creation, one of the residents was a woman by the name of Zella McCauley, who suffered from a condition that left her paralyzed from the waist down. You see, this home was for those with disabilities. And Zella was a resident of that home, but Zella was also an attender of ACAC. She was a part of this congregation in the very early years during this church's first pastor, which was Pastor Edie Whiteside. And it was during a service very much like this, but at the end of the service, Pastor Whiteside made an invitation for those who were sick to come to the front and receive prayer for their healing. Zella was in a wheelchair at the time, and I already told you she was paralyzed from the waist down. She came to the front in the wheelchair. She came forward in faith for prayer. And would you know that God miraculously healed her body and she left that service not needing a wheelchair any longer. Really? I mean, if Zella was here today, she would be like, I came down in a wheelchair and left without one and you give me a golf clap? I mean, seriously. Not that we would give her praise, but thanks to the almighty God. And would you know, God still heals today. May we never be a church that doesn't pray for sick and believe that God can heal. Well, it was shortly thereafter when Zella sensed, uh, she experienced God heal, God's healing. She sensed a call to be a missionary. And so she left and went to New York City and attended A.B. Simpson's Missionary Training Institute, which would later be known as Nyack College. And after completing her training, she left for the country of India, where she served for many years in a leper colony, serving and loving the least of these. 
I found a picture last week that I want to show you. This picture is from March 5th, 1911. It's from a local newspaper that was announcing Zella was going to return from India to Pittsburgh and she was going to be a guest speaker at the seventh annual convention of the Christian and Missionary Alliance here in Pittsburgh at Carnegie Hall. Now, why is this story? Why is Zella's story so compelling? Well, first and foremost, it is compelling because she experienced the powerful and miraculous healing of God. But it's also compelling to see what Zella did with her life after she experienced that healing. I mean, let's be really honest. If you or I were stuck to a wheelchair and paralyzed from the waist down and we experienced God's healing, how many of us would respond and give the rest of our life serving the least of these in India? We probably would have some dreams. There's probably some trips and vacations, some activities and hobbies that we couldn't do that we'd wanna do, right? But Zella didn't do that. She heard the call of God and responded in obedience to serve the least of these in India. The story is compelling because all of us recognize that we have a natural tendency to focus primarily on our own personal comfort and convenience. And this comfort and convenience also bleeds over into the call that you and I have to be witnesses in the world for Jesus Christ. Most of us know, and in Missions Month, you knew you were gonna hear the Great Commission. You could probably quote it from heart. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yet, when we do go, Oftentimes, when we go and share the good news of Jesus, we do so within the confines of our own comfortability and convenience. We reach our network of people, our neighborhoods, our city where we're comfortable, or even the nation from which we live. Now, make no mistake, it's very important, and we must share the light of Jesus to those around us, including our, neighbor, our neighborhoods, including this city, including this wonderful country that we live in. However, I want to challenge us today that when we limit our calling to reach people for Jesus only to those who are closest to us, our call is too small. As followers of Jesus here in the 21st century, we're not the only ones that have lived in this tension of sharing Jesus both to our neighbors and to the nations. The very first followers of Jesus also lived in that tension and wrestled with that same tendency with their own comfort, their own convenience, and their own community. I wanted to go, before we go to the book of Isaiah, if you remember the first chapter of Acts, it starts out, it's 40 days after Jesus died and resurrected and Luke tells us, the author of Acts, that Jesus was eating with his disciples. He was having a meal with some of those first followers. And he tells them, he says, hey, don't leave Jerusalem. The Father is going to send you the gift that was promised. This gift is the Holy Spirit. And this Holy Spirit is going to empower you for that commission, that mission that I've called all of you to be a part of. But then Listen to the heart, listen to the desire and the tendency of the early disciples and those first followers. Luke tells us that when the apostles, apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking Jesus, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? Now think about this. Jesus, it's 40 days after he comes back from the dead. He's having a meal with them. He's commissioned them and says, hey, don't leave because the Holy Spirit's gonna come and empower you for that mission. And what is the question that Jesus is getting peppered with by his disciples? Okay, is now the time that you're gonna free us? Are you gonna establish our kingdom? So they're even living in that tension of comfort and convenience. But see, despite this, Jesus was very specific with them and he's very specific with us about where he intends his followers to go and carry his light. Jesus says in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. Know today, he's not just speaking to those early disciples. He's speaking to us, you and I, everyone right now. You are to be a witness for Jesus. 
but he gets specific about where we are to be witnesses. Telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, is he speaking specifically geographically to those early disciples? Of course he is. He's saying, I want you to share this good news to those living in Jerusalem, to those in this region of Judea, to those in Samaria, a further region, and to the ends of the earth. But this message is also relevant for you and I today. And it goes beyond just a geographic location. What does Jesus mean when he says that we're to share that light, that gospel to Jerusalem? Here's what I believe Jesus means by that. What is your Jerusalem? Your Jerusalem, our Jerusalem, are those closest to us. Those that we live in relationship with, our family, our friends, those within our sphere of influence, those whom we regularly interact with. This should be the most natural place for us to start as we share the gospel of the good news. You are to be your witnesses, to be his witnesses in your Jerusalem. But you're not just to stay there. You're to be a witness also in Judea. So what would be our Judea? Those that are not in our immediate network or relationship. It could be a coworker. It could be the neighbor across the street. It could be an acquaintance in the community or other, other's parents whose kids are in the same school as yours. But we're not supposed to be witnesses just in Jerusalem, just in Judea. We're also supposed to go to Samaria. These are people whose lifestyle and culture is very different than ours. You see, you, you, many of you know this, but those early disciples, the Jewish believers, they didn't want to go to Samaria. But Jesus is saying, no, you're to go and to be my witnesses there. Meaning for you and I, we are to be witnesses even in areas that we don't want to necessarily go and be in. And then of course, we are to go to the ends of the earth. God's heart has always been to reach the ends of the earth. And anything short of that, honestly, is too small of thinking. The central activity of God in human history is that his light would reach every person in the world. Every person, every tribe, every tongue, every land, every country. It's the reason that missions aren't just one job the church does in a variety of other ministries. It's the very reason we exist. Every ministry here at ACAC is a missions ministry. What do I mean by that? We have lots of ministries here at the church, right? Kids ministry, student ministry, adult life ministry, men's ministry, women's ministry. I mean, we've got a lot of them. That's why there's an M at the name of every of our ministry, all right? Um, but every one of those ministries is a missions ministry. Why do we have kids ministry? It's not just to babysit your children while you sit here in service. It's so that they learn about Jesus and so that they become disciples who make disciples, that they go and tell their kids and their, their friends, rather, at school, that, that they would tell them about Jesus. Do we do specific age-appropriate things for middle school and high school students? Absolutely. But what's the ultimate goal of it? That they would follow Jesus and that they would share that good news with their friends. Same for men's ministry. Same for women's ministry. We want you to grow in your faith, but it's not just about you following Jesus. It's not even about you just being transformed by Jesus. It's about you going on mission with Jesus. Every ministry should be a missions ministry. Missions also isn't just a theme limited to a few passages of, of, of Scripture. It's the thread that runs through the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. So let's go back to that verse in the Old Testament. I mentioned Isaiah chapter 49, verse six. It's such a powerful word when it comes to missions. Okay, here it is. He says, this is the prophet Isaiah speaking, God speaking through him. It is too small a thing. Say that with me. It is too small a thing. For you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. So this is a prophetic message. This is God speaking through his prophet Isaiah. And God is speaking to and through his servant who is traditionally understood to be both the nation of Israel and ultimately Jesus, the Messiah. And 
the prophet, God is speaking through the prophet and saying, there are some things that are too small. And he's talking about the mission. And what exactly is it that God wants this servant to do? What is the nature, if you will, of the servant's mission? Well, God speaks through Isaiah and says, it is to be light to both Jew and Gentile. You see, a mission just to the Jew is too small. A mission just to the Gentile is too small. It's too small a thing for God's salvation to be only experienced by his people Israel. No, the grander plan is for the Gentiles or to the nations to also receive God's light. The mission is to see God's salvation reach to the ends of the earth. You see, while God chose Israel, no doubt God chose Israel to be his special people, but he never intended to limit the blessing of knowing him to Israel alone. God's objective from the very beginning, even when he was dealing primarily with the Jewish people in the Old Testament, is that one day, the Messiah who would come from Israel would make salvation available to all people. You and I should be very grateful for that. We're included in that. The word Gentile represents the nations. In fact, in some of your translations in Isaiah 49, 6, it says to carry a light, not to necessarily to the Gentile, but to the nations. In this text, Gentile and nations can be um, interwoven. And when we hear the word nations, we tend to think of that word country. We immediately picture maybe the shape of America, our own country on a map, or we think of the many other countries in the world that are defined by borders. However, in a biblical sense, the word nation doesn't represent a political entity, but rather a cultural entity or a people group. In fact, the New Testament word for nations is ta-ethne, in which we get the word ethnic. So when God says, I will make you a light to the nations, he was saying that we should be a light to every tribe, every tongue, and every people on the earth. Now, all of us would recognize and say that nothing is too big for God, right? Nothing is too big for God. Nothing is too great for God. But have you ever thought that there are some things that are too small for God? Let me challenge you with this. It's too small a thing for us only to be a light to people who look like us and talk like us. It's too small a mission for us to carry God's love to places that are comfortable and convenient. If we never go to the ends of the earth, our call is too small. Limiting God's grace to one people or nation would not be worthy of God. It would actually belittle him. It would turn the almighty God of the universe into just another tribal deity. See, if our comfort defines our mission, then we've shrunk God's call to fit our convenience. Comfort and convenience cannot define the call that God has for us to carry his light to the ends of the earth. It's interesting. Go back to the book of Acts chapter 13 the very first missionary journey of the apostle Paul and a man named Barnabas. They're in a city called Antioch and they're preaching. And Paul actually goes and quotes Isaiah 49, six, that verse that I just read to you a few moments ago. So he's preaching, him and Barnabas are preaching in the city of Antioch and they're preaching both to the Jew and to the Gentile. But the Jewish community leaders, um, they feel very threatened by Paul's message and they feel threatened by Barnabas. And so they reject the message, but Paul and Barnabas keep on preaching. And Luke tells us that this is what Paul says in that moment. Again, he quotes Isaiah 49, six, pay attention to this. Uh, Paul says, for this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. He quotes Isaiah 49, six. And then Luke says that when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and they honored the word of the Lord and all were who were appointed for eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord spread throughout the whole region. Now, I don't know if you caught this, but as Paul quotes Isaiah 49, six, he changes a couple words. Paul changed the word. He said, the Lord has commanded us. 
And then he said, I have made you. You see, Paul recognized that those prophetic words in Isaiah, him and Barnabas were living that out right now. And that all of the followers of Jesus, including you and I, that he was calling us, that he has commanded us that we would be a light to the Gentiles and to the ends of the earth. If comfort defines our mission, then we've shrunk God's call to fit our convenience. I want to show you a short but really powerful video about what happens, what can happen when we have a call that is too small. The video is called The Great Imbalance. And it shows in really practical, in real terms, what it's like when God's people limit their calling to comfort and convenience. Watch this, The Great Imbalance. So, When we use the phrase, the great imbalance, what are we talking about? Let's start with the basics, the Great Commission. When the resurrected Christ stood on the side of a mountain in Galilee and said, go, make disciples of all nations, it wasn't a suggestion, it was a commandment. Jesus even promised that before he comes back, we will accomplish his commission. So we're talking about the most important mission in the world. Now, Today on planet Earth, there are 7.75 billion people. And of those 7.75 billion people, over 3 billion of those people are unreached, meaning they have zero access to the gospel. Most of them will be born, live, and die without ever hearing about Jesus. That's around 40% of the world's population. We break the whole population down into people groups. These are groups that share language, culture, tribe, etc. Every single people group can be put in one of two categories, reached or unreached. And the Great Commission involves taking the number of unreached people groups to zero. Now, in order to accomplish any task, it takes determination, a plan, and resources. But this is where you'll find the great imbalance. Today, there are hundreds of millions of Christ followers in the world. These are people who understand and want the Great Commission to be accomplished. That's you, me, every Bible-believing church you've ever heard of. These believers donate hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars to their churches around the world. This money goes to pay for things like electricity, food, water, staff, missions, even things like handbells, I mean everything. And of the hundreds of billions of dollars given to the church, roughly $47 billion is already allocated to missions to the nations. But we don't just give money. Around 400,000 people are working as missionaries to the nations. But here's where all starts to fall apart. Remember our two groups, reached and unreached? Of these missions, resources, people, money, already specifically set aside for missions to the nations, only 1% of the money and 3% of the missionaries go to take the gospel to unreached people in the world. That means 99% of our mission's money and 97% of our missionaries are going to people that already have the gospel. This is the great imbalance. And with the world's population growing at the rate it is now, every day we're losing more ground than we gain. This is why the global church needs a new perspective on how and where we spend our resources if we want to truly obey the Great Commission. Forty percent of the world's population does not have access to the gospel. Truthfully, it's hard for us to wrap our brain around. Like, what do we mean by that? 40% of the world, it means they may not have access to a Bible. It could be because the Bible hasn't been translated into their language. It could be because the Bible is illegal where they live. It could mean that there are no Christians living in their communities. No one that can share the good news of the gospel with them. It could mean that nobody has taken the gospel to that community. 40% of our world. And yet out of the billions, billions of dollars that are given, 1% goes to reach 
the 40% of the world. Out of the hundreds of thousands of missionaries that are there, only 3% of those missionaries are living in those communities that are unreached. Now here's where you should be encouraged. And I'm gonna brag on our church and I'm gonna brag on our denomination. Our philosophy and our heart is to correct that imbalance. Do we share the gospel? Do we have missionaries serving in our city in reached areas? Of course we do. Do we allocate funds? Of course we do. But our hope and our priority is to focus on the unreached groups. It's why last year when there was nearly $6 million that came through ACAC, a million of that was directed towards missions and the majority of that going towards those unreached areas. It's why through this, this church's 130 year history, there are 131 missionaries that have been sent, many of which are, have gone and are going to unreached people groups. Uh, Blaine mentioned it earlier. You're going to have an opportunity after church in the hub lobby to meet RNA. A couple from this congregation who left, sold everything they have to go live in a community that didn't have the gospel. It's why our emphasis as a denomination, nearly 70% of all of the missionaries are going to those unreached people groups. You see, if our comfort defines our mission, then we've shrunk God's call to fit our convenience. Now, I love that we spend every October, that we take an entire month as a church to focus on missions. What you may not recognize is that's unusual for churches. It's unusual for a church to take an entire month to do this. However, one of my concerns is that by designating a once in a year, special time to focus on this, that we might be giving the impression that this is just a subject that we only need to address or preach about annually. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Missions aren't just one of the many jobs the the church does. It's the very reason the church exists still today. It's the reason you and I are still in this world. It's to carry his light to the ends of the earth. Throughout this month, I'm going to ask that you pray. Specifically, how is God calling you to go to the ends of the earth? I mentioned RNA. It was shortly after I was was here. I know it it had been in the works for a while, but um, R, and we use their, again, we use their initials because they serve in an area of the world where the gospel is illegal. He's a graphic designer, business owner, sold it, left it all behind, had kids, and they're now living in Central Asia. They're one of many. What would compel somebody to do that? What would compel Zella McAuley, after being healed, to go live in India serving the least of these? I recognize that most of you here today, God isn't necessary, necessarily calling you to go to one of those nations, but he could be, he could be. Are you even willing to listen to God's voice? Dare I say, even ask the question, God, are you calling me to go? Parents, are you brave enough to have conversations with your kids about missions? Could God be calling your son or your daughter to go? Could God be calling you to give sacrificially to support someone like RNA and the many others to go, to help us correct that great imbalance, to give to support the work that is there sharing the gospel in unreached people groups? Could God be calling you specifically to pray in ways that you've never prayed before, to serve, to get involved in missions? I encourage you today, Read through this. We have missionaries serving all over the world. We need people to touch base with them, to know that they're not forgotten, to send an email or a card to say, hey, I'm praying for you today. What do you need? How can we help? It's one way that you can be involved. But over the next month, I'm imploring you. Missions isn't something we just do once a month. This is our call as a church and as followers of Jesus. And if we limit that calling to our comfortability and our convenience, 
It's a call far too small.